Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm an airline pilot and in today's video I want to explain to you why there can be such a huge difference in the takeoff speeds calculated in the Phoenix performance calculator. So this applies to the 319, 320 and Airbus A321 likewise and also would apply to any of the larger Airbuses by the way. But let's go ahead and start with something basic. So I have planned to sort of runway 23 left over here with the intersection Lima 3. If we have a look at the intersection data you can see that we have a runway available of 2235 meters over here versus a full runway length of 2700 meters. If I use Lima 3 for my takeoff calculation I get takeoff speeds of 129, 129 and 133. Compared to that, if we take the full length, 2,700 meters, so you can see we get 140, 140 and 144. Now, you might surely ask yourself, and a lot of you have asked that question underneath my comments and live streams, why is there such a difference, especially in the V2 speed and in the rotation speed? Now, let's go ahead and start with something basic, and that is understanding what limits each of those speeds. We're going to start with a V1 speed. So V1 is the speed after which the takeoff must no longer be aborted unless the um, ability of the aircraft to be able to fly is in doubt. So let's say if you lose a wing due to a collision then obviously you are going to reject the takeoff. Now in order to be able to continue the takeoff V1 needs to meet certain criteria. If we have a look at the airplane from the outside then we can explain this rather nicely. Let's say an engine fails on takeoff. We are going to lose engine number one over here. Now what happens is engine number two, the only engine providing thrust now, is located not exactly on the center of the aircraft, but it's located outboard. That means a turning moment is going to start to develop. The airplane needs to be able to counter that turning moment by the use of the rudder. Now the rudder can only develop a certain amount of force depending on the speed of the aircraft. Therefore, in order for the rudder to be able to counter the yaw created by only one engine running, we need to reach a certain minimum speed. This is called the minimum control speed on the ground. And this speed limits your V1 speed because obviously you need to continue the takeoff if an engine failure happens at or after V1. But of course the aircraft needs to be controllable. Another limit is of course posed by the length of the runway available. If we have a look at Düsseldorf over here, then you can see that from intersection Lima 3 we have 2200 and a bit meters on runway 23 left from Lima 1, so from the full length of 2700 meters and including all the um, displaced thresholds, 3000 meters is the complete runway length. Now, Stopping the aircraft of course also needs to be assured and that is another factor that can limit V1. So just until V1, if you reject, you need to be able to stop the aircraft including the um, runway length and the length of the stopway over here. So all of this limits the V1 speed to the bottom. V1 is limited to the top by the rotation speed of course and a couple other factors but what's important for us today is the rotation speed. Now V2 of course also is limited by the minimum control speed since if the engine fails you will climb at V2 to V2 plus 15 depending on the manufacturer and airline maybe a little bit more a little bit less but for V2 you have the very same problem the aircraft needs to be controllable and the lawmakers have come up with a rule that you need to have only so much bank together with the use of the rudder in order to be able to fly a straight line. And therefore the rudder again needs to have a certain effectiveness. This is called the minimum control speed in the air. So minimum control speed air. This limits V2 on the lower part and on the upper range V2 is usually limited by the fact that you have to achieve a certain minimum climb gradient. Of course you could just accelerate right a couple of feet above the runway to 200 knots and the aircraft would fly perfectly fine. But then you would probably slam into some bridges or buildings or whatever after the runway. So 
The upper limit is normally determined by the climb gradient you need to be able to achieve. And as you can see, with these limits, we now have to think about what our takeoff speeds are going to be. And even though the takeoff calculator only gives you a single speed here, like for example 140, 140, 144, the actual speeds would be a range of speeds. So the lower V1 limit would be quite a bit lower. As we have seen, if we take an intersection over here, we get 129. So, of course, if you take the full runway length, you could also continue the takeoff from 129 knots, since you have more runway available. But, now, since we have a longer runway available, we might be able to use a greater flex temperature in order to limit the amount of stress on the aircraft. Or, we might be able to choose higher takeoff speeds. The advantage of higher takeoff speeds is of course better controllability of the aircraft in case of a rejected takeoff and greater oh sorry in case of continued takeoff and greater stop margins and greater safety margins in case of a rejected takeoff. So if we reject the takeoff at 139 knots coming from the full length, we might just about be able to stop the aircraft on the runway. But if we continue from 140 knots onwards, then we are going to have greater airspeed and therefore it will be easier for us to control the aircraft. And basically what the programmer of the performance tool or the airline in the real world now needs to do is to find a good compromise between where do I want my actual takeoff speeds to be. You always get a range of speeds. So you have a range of V1s, you have a range of V2s and now the operator needs to pick from that range. Now, depending on the decision of the operator, you might always get higher speeds, you might always get lower speeds, or you might get changing speeds. And the changing speeds are what Phoenix have gone for. Now, what Phoenix went for, I believe, is the balanced field concept. So they basically try to reach a certain point on the runway where rejecting the takeoff would take the same distance as continuing the takeoff. Now, this results in changing speeds depending on the length of the runway. So, if you take the intersection where you have less runway available, then obviously you will need a lower V1 speed so that you are still able to stop the aircraft on the runway if the failure happens. On the other hand side, you then also want to take a lower V2 speed because if we would continue the takeoff from 129 knots onwards, but use a higher V2, that would mean we'd have to accelerate on the runway before the aircraft um, would be allowed to lift off. Because the rotation speed in that case would be quite a bit higher, closer to the V2 speed. Now, as you can see, there is always a certain range of criteria available. And different performance calculators are going to make different choices here depending on what you um, have programmed in the settings. So just to give you another example over here, let's have a quick look at the SimBrief calculation for this takeoff. So here's the SimBrief performance calculator. And if we calculate this on runway 23 left on the full length, you can see that if we take the raw output, that's a bit um, easier to see. We get takeoff speeds of 119, 119 and 123 over here. So you can see that SimBrief is going for completely different numbers, but still those are valid numbers according to the range of data that is calculated for you. So if people ask me what is better, the Phoenix calculator or the SimBrief calculator, the only answer I can give to that is both are very good, but both use a different calculation method and both results are completely valid. So that's the most important point here. I do hope this video gave you a little bit of an insight into how those performance calculations work and what some of the factors influencing it are. Do let me know your feedback in the comments below. Obviously, I did try to simplify things in here and I've left a couple of things out intentionally in order just to give you an overview and this is of course not a replacement for an actual performance class. Nonetheless, I hope that this gave you a basic idea of why the range of speeds can vary that much 
and I hope this clarifies why in some cases you might get takeoff speeds of 160 knots, while if you just take an intersection you might get 140 knots. This totally makes sense if you think about it from this perspective. And with all of this out of the way, thank you very much for watching. I sure hope that you learned something today. As always, be sure to like, comment and subscribe. And if you really like what I'm doing on this channel, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link on the video description below. Thank you very much for watching and I see you all again on the next one.